Heavenly Father, if we see Christ through your word, um, our souls are fed well. And if we do not see him, we, we starve. Lord, we thirst for you. We thirst for your son, Jesus. Will you please draw near to us in your word and reveal yourself to us? And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Please take your Bibles and let's open up to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Today, we reach the theme verses for the entire letter. In verses 16 and 17, you probably have them memorized. If you've been a Christian for a while, you're very familiar with these verses. Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous by faith shall live. This is the theme of his whole letter. We finally reached it today after having worked through the first 15 verses. Everything that follows from verses 16 and 17 are there in the letter to establish this theme, this truth, this reality. But this theme follows very closely on the heels of Paul's statement in verse 15 about his eagerness to preach the gospel in Rome. Look at verse 15. So, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes and so forth. The theme is the explanation for his eagerness, his readiness to preach the gospel. How's your eagerness doing these days for this, to preach the gospel? How's your eagerness at school or at work, in your neighborhood, in your own home, your your own family? Are you ready like a batter? gets ready and steps into the batter's box, he's ready to swing at the pitch that he knows is coming. Are you, are you that kind of ready? The theme of the letter is full of fortifications that will strengthen your readiness, that will undergird you in your eagerness and readiness to preach the gospel. So this morning, do you, do you need to be fortified in your eagerness? Is your eagerness a bit wobbly? If so, consider these five fortifications under eager gospel preachers. Number one, the gospel cures shame. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Well, where does shame come from? Well, we have to go back, way back. And I want you to go back with me to Genesis chapter 2, that far back. You can't go back much further than that, but Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. You see, Adam and Eve originally had a nearness to God that was totally uninhibited, unhindered. They had a, a nearness to God that was intimate with him. He walked with them as their God, and they walked with him in the garden in free, unrestricted fellowship. It says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, that the man and his wife were both naked And they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed of what they were. They were not ashamed of who their God was to them. And they were not ashamed of how they thought they looked being naked. Until they sinned. And then a Pandora's box was opened, and out came this legion of self-awareness and self-concern. A new way of looking at self came to be because of their sin. 
They put self at the center of everything. Self-concern, self-protection became the lens through which they saw everything, including their God. They were ruled by this. They're ruled even by how they thought they looked naked. Verse 7 of chapter 3, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they covered themselves up, and they were concerned about how they thought they looked now. And they didn't want to be associated with God anymore either. That once innocent and selfless, self-unaware, unhindered fellowship with God was ruined. Over. So they hid in shame even from him. Verse 8 of chapter 3, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Sin makes us ashamed, ashamed of God, where we would not even want to be associated with him any longer. So what happened when that God took on human flesh in his son Jesus and stepped into that human race? More of the same. He came to his own, John 1.11 says. Jesus came to his own, the Jews, and his own did not receive him. They didn't want to be associated with him either. They were embarrassed by his scandalous birth. They were Embarrassed by his Nazarene origin, they were ashamed of his Galilean upbringing, they were ashamed of his brand of messiahship, and when they were given the chance to, they shamed him. They put a purple robe on him, and they beat into his brow a crown of thorns, and they made him hold a reed like it was a scepter of a king, and they mocked him. And they did not lift him up to a king's throne, but they lifted him up to a criminal's cross, and he hung in the shame of nakedness there. Sin is shameful. It makes us ashamed of God. It makes us want to put the shame on him. And now, in that kind of a world where sinners in shame either hide from God or they want to kill him if they can, his good news goes forth, the gospel. The men and women and boys and girls who think murderous thoughts, shameful thoughts against him, those are the ones that we preach the gospel to. And so we shouldn't be shocked to find out that oftentimes sinners believe the gospel is foolishness. Something shameful. Sin makes them ashamed of God. Sin makes them ashamed of a crucified king. What do we expect? Do we expect them to think the gospel is something respectable, honorable in this world? But what's heartbreaking is that even those who have been saved by the Savior and his gospel still sometimes shrink back in shame because of it. Jesus had to warn his disciples about this, did he not? Listen to Mark 8, 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And Paul had to warn even his dearest disciple, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 about this very thing. Therefore, Timothy, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. There are times when believers, when the church, 
are all tempted to be ashamed of God, to be ashamed of Jesus, and to be ashamed of his gospel. The wise of the world start to sound convincing. And in their classification of the gospel as foolishness, we start to give in to shame. And we distance ourselves from the gospel and we act like we don't know it. But listen to Paul in verse 12 of 2 Timothy 1. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. And in Romans 1, 15, back there again, so for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. He is eager. He is ready to preach. He's eager to be identified with the gospel. He's eager to be associated with it. And any shame over it is gone. That's proven by his readiness, his eagerness to preach it. You see, if you're ashamed of the gospel, you don't want to be identified with it. And you can therefore never be ready to preach it in that condition. But take care of the shame so that you actually want to be identified with it and your eagerness to preach will be at full strength. Well, how? How did Paul rid himself of any lingering shame within over the gospel? Get this, by plunging into it even deeper. Usually when you're ashamed of something or someone, the shame directs you away from that thing and that person, and we obey the shame, we act on the shame, and we leave. But God's way for you to deal with any lingering shame that you might have concerning the gospel is to actually go nearer to it to go deeper into it because the gospel itself is the cure for any shame you might feel in regards to it. And this will fortify you. It'll help your eagerness and readiness to preach be strong. This is what Paul says. I am eager to preach the gospel to you, verse 15. Why? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God. Do you see what he just did? Do you see where he turned us? He turned us into the gospel to take a closer look there. The cure for shame regarding the gospel is to look more closely into the gospel. The cure for being ashamed of the gospel is to not change the gospel. It is not to adjust the gospel. It is not to redefine it, modify it, bend it, paint it, sand it, or buff it out. or to make it more palatable. The cure is just simply dust it off and take a closer look. If you are to be eager to preach the gospel, you must be fortified with this first fortification. The gospel cures shame. How? Number two, because the gospel is the power of God. Here's why you don't need to blush regarding the gospel. Power. This power that the gospel is, is your cure for any lingering shame. Come here with your shame. Stay here for a while. Gaze on the power of God that the gospel is, and your wrong thinking about the gospel will be corrected very quickly. Now, does the gospel contain power? Absolutely. But Paul says more than that. Does the gospel exert power? Absolutely. But Paul says more than that. The gospel is the power. What power? Supreme power. Almighty power. It is the power of God. That means the power of the gospel is not one power among a group of other powers. It's not like Captain America sitting among the other Marvel heroes in all of their power. It is the one and only power that matters. Remember in chapter 1, verse 4, that Jesus is the eternal Son of God in power at the resurrection. The Son of God in power has encapsulated his power to the gospel such that it equals the power of God. This means it will do what God asks it to do. This means that 
if you do not have the gospel, you do not have the power of God. Whatever else you may turn to that may seem powerful or effective to you or capable, it can't do and it won't do what the power of God does. The gospel that is the power of God does what therapists and government agencies and programs and human love and human approval are completely incapable of doing and are completely unaware of. Here's your cure for any lingering shame within you regarding the good news of Jesus of Nazareth, a crucified Galilean. That's who you believe in. Look deeper into the gospel. The gospel is not the philosophy that will cure your shame. And it is not the well-structured treatise that will cure your shame. And it is not the good piece of advice that will cure your shame. It is the power of God that will cure your shame. Fortify yourself with this and you will be eager. You will be ready to be associated with his gospel and you will preach it. But power toward what? That leads us to the third fortification for eager gospel preachers. The gospel cures shame because the gospel is the power of God in this, that it saves every believing one. The gospel saves every believer, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The exalted Son of God in power, does not direct the gospel, which is his power, toward self-help or self-improvement. He doesn't direct that power in helping you find your untapped potential within. He does not direct the gospel, which is his power, toward social injustice corrections because none of those things are salvation. The Son of God, in power, directs His power, which is the gospel, to salvation. Let me ask you a question. What do you think is wrong with you? What do you think is wrong with you? Because how you answer that question tells what you think about power and salvation. If you think you're like a cat that climbed up a tree and got stuck, well, if that's what's wrong with you, what kind of a rescue corresponds to that little predicament? What kind of power is required for that rescue? Or maybe you think of yourself more like an injured athlete on the field and you need the kind of help that corresponds to a a trainer helping you off the field in your own power. Or do you think you're just lost and you need some directions? Well, what kind of power do you need for that? You see, what you think is wrong with you says a lot about what you think salvation is and what kind of power you need. And what do you think about what you need to gain, where you need to go, where you're supposed to arrive at? Are you in need of getting to the place where you just feel better about yourself? Well, what kind of power is needed to get you there from where you are? Or do you think you need to get to a place where others just have better thoughts and better opinions of you? I mean, what kind of power corresponds to getting you to there from where you are? Listen, the resurrected Son of God in power directs His power, that is the gospel, toward none of those things. Because none of those is salvation. You need to be delivered from something far more perilous, and you need to be delivered to something far more grand than any of those things. And you need a power that corresponds to both of those. The Son of God in power directs His almighty power that is the gospel to save you from your greatest danger and save you to your greatest treasure. In Romans, Paul is going to make it clear in just a matter of words that your greatest danger is God. Look at verse 18. 
for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What are these men doing? They are suppressing the truth about God in their unrighteousness. You see, your true peril lies in him. Your sin has not put you at a disadvantage. It has made you a holy God's enemy. Sin has not wounded you such that you have to rely on a life coach to help you walk off the field. It has killed you spiritually before God and his eternal wrath is coming. You are in the deepest abyss of wrath according to God's righteous assessment of you and you need to be saved from him, the judge. The gavel is in his hand. He has lifted his hand high. He has slammed it down hard. He has declared you guilty. The case is closed against you. The sentence has been passed and the day of wrath is coming. And you don't need self-improvement. You need salvation from God. What power corresponds to that? What power can reach into the abyss where you are at, find you, seize you, and lift you out? And you need salvation not just from God. You need salvation to God. The gospel reveals your greatest treasure to be Jesus Christ. Such that if you had the choice of getting heaven, but he wasn't there, you wouldn't want heaven because you want him. Thankfully, God doesn't offer that. The goal of the gospel is Jesus. He is the highest good. He's the only good. And he is the only love for your soul. He is your only everything. He is the treasure worth losing all other treasures to gain. What power corresponds to doing that in you? What power can lift your affections up that high? What power can actually lift you, raise you up, seat you with him in the heavenly places? What power can turn your affections from being ashamed of him to only wanting to be with him? What power can take you from the one who is more perilous than you think to the one who is more precious than you'll ever know? The power of God for salvation. The Son of God in power directs His power that is the gospel to saving sinners from Him and His wrath to save them to Himself. Well, who? Everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. Now, let's be clear about the ones who experience this almighty power of Jesus Christ in salvation. It does not say this. It doesn't say, Paul does not say, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone, period. Not everyone was saved, not everyone is being saved, and not everyone will be saved. God will judge under his eternal and righteous wrath many, 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 many sinners who never came into contact with the power of God for salvation. It's heartbreaking. And Paul does not say, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who hears the gospel. He doesn't say it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who goes to church. And he doesn't say it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who does more good than their bad. And it doesn't say it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has believing parents or a believing spouse. Let's be clear about who the everyones are here that are saved by the power of God. Believing ones, believers, those who believe. The gospel doesn't save everyone. It saves every believing one, every one who believes. And I tell you, this is a huge comfort for those who believe. Here is his promise. He will not let you go. He will not let you go, believer. He will not change his disposition toward you, though you give him every day every reason to change his disposition towards you of love because of your indwelling sin. 
His promise still stands that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for every believing one. Your faith and his power to save are in a holy union he will not break up. That means we need to rightly understand what it means to believe, what this faith is. Let's talk about what it isn't. Here's what Paul isn't saying. Let's go back to the abyss picture. The Son of God is not doing this. The Son of God in power does, has not loaded his gospel gun with his almighty finger on the trigger just waiting to pull it, and now he's just waiting for a dead sinner down there at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath to muster up some kind of faith on his own down there. And when the Son of God in power sees that version of faith, boom, saved you. You see, that kind of faith would be meritorious. It would merit salvation. That's not what Romans will teach us in a matter of just days, weeks. Saving faith is the faith that the Son of God in power brings with him in the gospel as he descends into the abyss of wrath that you live in and are kept in until the day of wrath. And there is no faith in the bottom of that pit that is birthed there, originates there, created there by any sinner that would move Jesus to save that one. There's only hostility toward him there. There's only contempt for Jesus there. There's only shame over Jesus found there. Not faith, but the Son of God in power descends into the abyss of wrath, bringing faith with him in the power of the gospel. And he commands sinners at the bottom of that abyss, believe me with this faith. And he who powerfully descended in the gospel with that gospel faith is the one who powerfully lifts that one up who believes. Again, faith is not a meritorious work that merits the power of God for salvation. You know what it's like? Faith is like a a cup that Jesus brings to you and you're in the middle of a waterless desert. There you've been dying of thirst and eating sand and there you've been plotting Jesus' death if you see him. And in mercy... Jesus comes to you and he hands you the cup that you don't have that he brought. And he holds forth his water of life and he commands you to hold it still while he pours. You simply receive. He commanded you to do something you never thought to do, and he supplied you with what you needed to receive his life. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should boast. Have you believed with that faith? The command to believe from King Jesus means this. It it means to trust what he says in the gospel is true about your condition there at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath. It means to wholeheartedly accept what he says about you there. It means to believe and to rely on and depend on him and on him alone to raise you in power out from your spiritual death, out of his just sentence of wrath over you. It is to cast everything you know of yourself on everything that you know of him. It is to trust that the death of this Son of God is your only release from wrath. And Paul says it doesn't matter if you're a Jew who believes or a Greek who believes. That's a non-Jew. Verse 16, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But there is a a priority in the gospel toward the Jews, and that is seen by the word first. And this goes all the way back to Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, who then had 12 sons who became 12 tribes, out of which one of those tribes, the tribe of Judah, comes Messiah. Messiah came to his people, and they did not receive him. 
And in the capital city of the Jews, they crucified their Messiah. And the preaching of the gospel radiated out from that Jewish center of the world. And Paul went to every synagogue that was in any city, in any Gentile city around the world. And that priority has in the gospel never hindered God from going to the Gentiles. But rather, that priority of the Jews becomes the occasion for the Gentiles who believed. And sadly, the Jews, everywhere Paul went, rejected that priority, but God hasn't. God hasn't rejected their priority. He's maintaining their priority, and he will give it to them according to his promise once the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And he gives three chapters devoted to that, Romans 9, 10, and 11. So fortify yourselves with this, believer, and you will be eager to preach the gospel. What? The gospel saves every believing one. So preach the gospel clearly. Preach it frequently. Call sinners to believe the power of God that is the gospel is directed to save everyone who believes. Every believer. Confidently call them to believe knowing what God does in his power. The fourth fortification, number four, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God, verse 17. Then this is the explanation of how the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Because, verse 17, in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Well, what does that mean? In some sense, Paul is saying that there is no salvation without this righteousness being revealed. Now first, take note of whose righteousness this is that is revealed. It is God's righteousness. It is a righteousness that finds its origin in him, and therefore it belongs to him. And that is the only righteousness that matters in regards to the salvation of unrighteous sinners. The gospel, listen, understand this. The gospel does not come into your presence and say, reveal to me your version of righteousness, and I'll save you. The gospel knows better. At the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, there we are in all of our unrighteousness. The gospel doesn't seek some filthy version of righteousness that unrighteous people muster up on their own. The gospel reveals quite another, utterly distinct, completely the opposite kind of righteousness. The only righteousness that matters, God's righteousness. If a believing sinner is going to be saved, the gospel must in some way reveal his righteousness. That's what Paul is getting at. We need to understand clearly what Paul means by this, though. Think about this. If the gospel came to the unrighteous at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, that's where we were, believers. And if the gospel came there and only said, see God's righteousness, See his attribute of righteousness. Listen, that would not be good news for the unrighteous. That would be equivalent to saying, do you see his justice? That sinner would shriek out a scream for rocks to cover him up and hide him from the righteousness of God, the justice of God that he deserves. Or, or think of the revealing this way. Think about God's justice at the flood. Think about God's righteousness at the flood. It could be said that the flood revealed the righteousness of God over a world of unrighteousness. He gave men the justice, the righteous act of judgment they deserved. It revealed it. God destroyed man. That's what happens when God's attribute of righteousness or justice is revealed. Judgment. There's no good news there. But when the gospel reveals the righteousness of God, the opposite happens. The unrighteous who believe are saved, not judged. Judged. 
Simply seeing the righteousness of God, like men did at the flood, that doesn't save. So in the case of the gospel, something else is going on than just the revelation of God's attribute of justice or his righteousness. The righteousness of God in the gospel is a righteousness of his that he gives the believing sinner. That's what's revealed. And since he is the source of this righteousness that he gives, he therefore is pleased with it. He's inclined towards it. In fact, he even obligates himself to it because it's his. What Paul means by revealing the righteousness of God is that it is given by God to the believing sinner such that when God looks upon that believing sinner in all of his unrighteousness, God is persuaded by his own righteousness that he gave. And that is good news. That righteousness of God satisfies him as he sees it. That believing sinner could be assured that he is safe with God, even though he deserves another flood. That's good news. What the unrighteous need down at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, where we are rotting in our own unrighteousness, where we sit under God's just condemnation over us, what we need there is a righteousness that we don't possess, but that God will accept. The gospel reveals that to those who believe God provides the very righteousness that his righteousness requires him to require. In his courtroom of justice, his righteousness is the only valid righteousness that persuades him. We're calling it gospel righteousness, a righteousness that is tied inseparably to the preaching of the gospel. And Paul says in verse 17 that that righteousness God gives is revealed from faith to faith, that's an interesting pairing of faiths, is it not? What is going on with this pair of faiths? Well, were there any other pairs of faith like this in our context to help us decide? The most immediate pairing of faith is right back in verse 16. To everyone who believes, to the Jew who believes, and to the Greek who believes. There's a pair of faith the righteousness of God that God gives to sinners is revealed when a Jew believes and when a Greek believes. From that faith to the other faith, God's righteousness is revealed. Or we could say it another way. No matter where this faith is, whether it's in a Jew or whether it's in a Greek, there the righteousness of God is being revealed. There's an earlier pairing even before that in the chapter. Look at verse 12. Paul says, that, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both your faith and my faith. This is why Paul loved having his faith rub up against the faith of others, because faith, no matter where it was, revealed the righteousness which God gives in salvation. So fortify yourself with this. That the gospel reveals God's righteousness in its good news, in its salvation, in connection with faith, and you'll find yourself more eager and ready to preach. Think about it. The gospel reveals something about God. It reveals God's righteousness, not ours. Listen, Catholicism reveals man's righteousness. Islam reveals man's righteousness. Mormons reveal man's righteousness. And any other cult-like thing like this and other world religion only reveals the righteousness of men because all of these propose to save sinners on the basis of their works. And God will not accept that version of righteousness. In fact, those versions of righteousness only provoke him to greater wrath. Preach the gospel so that God's righteousness is revealed when sinners believe and are saved. The last fortification expands on what he means by the gospel reveals the righteousness of God from one faith to the next faith. Lastly, number five, fortify yourself with this. The gospel recovers justification by faith alone. 
the gospel recovers justification by faith alone. What we've been moving towards in the prior point, we just need to now come out and say as clearly as we can in theological terms, the righteousness of God that is revealed in the gospel is the righteousness of God, which is the righteous status God declares over the sinner who believes. He, God, justifies that sinner on the basis of faith and of faith alone. The gospel reveals justification by faith alone when the gospel powerfully saves those who believe. And Paul's final point at the end of verse 17 is what kind of a revealing this is. It is a revealing of the righteousness of God that is essentially a recovery of justification by faith because he quotes the Old Testament In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. This isn't anything new, just as it is written. And he quotes Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4. He appeals to an Old Testament text. But the righteous by faith shall live. I think by faith goes better with the righteous than it does modifying shall live. The righteous, the ones who are righteous by faith. They're the ones who live before God. They're the ones who are saved. That Old Testament text taught the same thing Paul was preaching in the gospel. That the righteous man by faith is the one who has life with God. This lets us know that this gospel revelation that Paul is preaching is not a new revelation, a never before seen one, but now clear for the very first time. No, it's the revealing of the righteousness of God that is the recovery of an ancient doctrine of justification by faith alone. Habakkuk knew it. Abraham knew it. Genesis 15, 6, then Abraham believed in in Yahweh and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. He declared him righteous on the basis of faith alone. You see, the problem in Paul's day was this, that the Jewish nation, not in totality, but almost in totality, had abandoned this salvation of justification by faith alone. They abandoned that righteousness of God which he requires and gives. Instead, they were impressed with their own bankrupt version of righteousness and they mustered up by obeying the law. That is, for the most part, what Israel had become and had done with God's salvation message. And so from Jerusalem to every Gentile city and every synagogue there, that's the the message of salvation they exported as a nation. Become a Jew, obey the law, and you will be righteous. That's what Paul faced everywhere he went across the Mediterranean world. He came up against that. But the gospel reveals in the sense that it recovers this righteousness of God or justification by faith alone that had been buried under the the refuse pile of their own self-righteousness. That is what they wanted to reveal to the world, their own righteousness. Look how we do with the law. But God's glory is at stake. And Paul was eager to preach the gospel so that it could reveal in the sense of recover, justification by faith alone. Listen, the gospel was not a new trend for Paul, but it was the old salvation by grace alone through faith alone. And he is going to hammer on this in chapter three. Do you understand how Paul could say, I am eager to preach the gospel? Do you understand? If you were to be an eager preacher of the gospel, ready yourself with these five fortifications. That number one, the gospel cures me of any shame over it that I might have. How? Well, number two, by being the power of God. But power toward what end? Number three, the gospel saves every believing one. How? Why? Four, because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed by faith. And that means, five, the gospel recovers the ancient doctrine of justification by faith alone. But what about this? How can God 
be righteous or just. If he declares those who are actually unrighteous to now be righteous in his sight. In any courtroom today, if a judge treated a lawless, law-breaking man as if he was only ever obedient to the law, we would all cry, foul. That's unjust. Is God unrighteous to declare the unrighteous righteous on the basis of faith alone? And the answer to that is an overwhelming no. But how? This is where we go to the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ. God maintained his justice. God got his justice by taking the sin and the unrighteous of every believing one and putting it all on Christ and crushing him. God poured out the justice that our sins deserved on Christ. And so God's justice was upheld. His justice was satisfied at the cross. And then by faith and faith alone, God declares over the believer a new status that the believer could never do by being given rules and asked to obey. That justification by faith alone, that righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel when it is powerful to save everyone who believes. Jesus Christ crucified is the only way it happens and can be true. Only at the cross is God both just and the justifier of the one who has faith. Listen, the command in the gospel from this Son of God with power is to repent and to believe. Don't bring any good works. Repent of that. Don't bring any good works. Instead, trust Jesus. Cast yourself on Jesus. You may feel like you're just learning about who you are according to what God's word says. And you may feel like you're just starting to learn a little bit about who he is. Listen, cast everything you know about yourself on everything you know about him, and the whole rest of your life is just increasing both of those two parts. You'll learn more and more and more and more about yourself, and you will have to continue to cast what you know about yourself on everything you're learning about him, and you will learn more, and you will learn more, and you will learn more. Cast yourself on him, cast your works in the trash and come to Christ and you will be saved by faith and faith alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the eager gospel preachers in my life who came and preached. Lord, help us to now in turn do the same with those in our lives to be eager to preach the gospel. Will you fortify this church with these gospel fortifications? Fortify our ready readiness. Send us into the world where we live and to places we have not yet been that we might preach. Father, I pray for the soul here who knows that he or she right now is not safe with you. Oh God, be merciful to them as you were to so many of us. Open their eyes that they might see how perilous their condition is with you and how precious your son is to you. Save them from you to you by the power of God that is the gospel through faith and faith alone. Reveal your justification by faith alone in that. Glorify yourself in that. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.